me feeling like I'm academics. Dang it, we got it. We got a little bit more. So, uh, shout out to my man Bradford Cohen, who actually went on Law and Crime. Another and, rapper, federal. And he spoke about pretty much what the government has on Dirk, and he's pretty much talking about what's necessary. Now, we've given our opinion. He's an actually reputed lawyer. He's dealt with Fed cases a lot. He's gonna give give us his opinion. He did it on Law and Crime. Shout out to them. Now, what we said is that this case is heavily dependent on a snitch. Because there's nothing that really ties, again, not, none of this stuff looks good for Dirk. I'm not going to say it looks good. But it's heavily dependent on somebody who's cooperating, who's going to corroborate the fact that Dirk did in fact put a hit on somebody and did in fact somehow indirectly or through a third party pay these guys for the death um, and the commission of the murder um, or, or, or the attempted murder on Quando Rondo, but the death of Lil Pop. So here we're going to have Bradford Cohen break it down. He gives us some inf interesting information. Let me go take a picture real quick and refill my cup. Into the show, Bradford Cohen, to talk more about this. Bradford, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. We have another rap star taken into custody on some pretty serious charges. Very different than the Sean Combs case, which we've been talking so much about. Just what are your initial thoughts on the indictment, the affidavit, these initial documents, and the initial allegations uh, alleged by prosecutors? So I think that when we look at the indictment itself, what's so interesting is, you know, and this happens quite often, they don't put all and everything that they have in the indictment because they don't have to, right? Either less is more for uh, an assistant U.S. attorney or the U.S. attorney's office. And in this case, I think that's what they did. They gave them enough to know that they know what's going on, but not enough to know everything that's going on. I think obviously there's been some rumors that there's been a snitch among his group that have been that has been wearing a wire for some time. And if that's the case, it's going to be a very difficult case for everyone involved, depending on how much talking there was going on. What I thought was interesting with the indictment is. Uh, you know, a lot of things around Dirk basically revolve around funding that he paid for air airport, he paid for uh, um, flights, he paid for hotels, he paid for car rentals, all these things that they utilized in this, um, you know, quote unquote, murder for hire plot. So that's really where they're mm -hmm. tying him in right now. But I think there's going to be more to come. And I think that uh, there's going to be individuals that either will flip or that have already flipped or there's going to be someone very uh, close. I, I heard what he said the last part. You, you know what's going to be interesting, Chet? So usually what we see like in drug cases or whatever is that, um. by the way, this is Diet Coke. Um, what am I drinking? I think it's Smirnoff. It's some cheap shit. I don't know. Um, what was going to be interesting is this, Chet. Well, in drug cases, when, you know, the, the money, because it's gotten through illicit means, gets frozen, will they try to affect Dirk's funds? Now, that could drastically change how this turns out. If Dirk essentially can't use, you know, I think Dirk at one point claimed that, you know, I don't know, he made hundreds of millions, right? Now, does he have hundreds of millions? I would be very shocked if Dirk has hundreds of millions. I would imagine he has tens of millions at his disposal. Um, obviously then he has investments that, you know, if it comes down to it, same with Diddy, you have to liquidate or you have to just whatever, just to get access to those funds. Cause your money's going to be your best tool here. If they kind of come up with either Rico that turns his money against him in a way where they feel that a forfeiture should be able to freeze it. For example, you know, him getting money through music would be non-illicit ways, which means, yo, he got it legally. But if they put together this argument to say, well, he was committing these crimes, allegedly, and these crimes that he was committing became the fodder and the promotion for the music, right? And that the, the success of the music, is, I think that's a really hard thing to prove, but that the success of the music wouldn't have been so if he wasn't doing all this crime, it, they could possibly try to freeze some shit. I don't think it will happen, but this is an angle because currently, you know, to Bradford Cohen's point, they're pinning, um, they're pointing out Dirk as the money man, money man, money man, money man. And, you know, 
we could say it came through legal reasons with the um or legal means with with his career but if his career is about all about this type of stuff isn't it intermingled we'll, we'll find out later anyway let me let me get back to it close to him that that was wearing a wire uh that would be willing to testify as to his involvement because his involvement right now is kind of tangentially involved right where he's the funder but there's no allegation, direct allegation that he said, hey, this is what I want done. There's an allegation that he'd spoken code and he could have said this and all these different things. But there's no allegation that says, hey, this is what he said and this is what was going to happen. And, and to be clear, when we're talking about this, obviously, there are multiple people involved. You can't have a conspiracy unless there are several people involved, especially something like this. Sure. So although Banks might be the most famous of the names that are called out in the indictment, he's not the only one. I'm going to list them out. In the indictment, we have Kavan London Grant. We have DeAndre Dontrell Wilson. We have Keith Jones, David Brian Lindsay, and Aza uh, Houston. And the indictment also names five co-conspirators, with Banks being one of them. In the indictment, he's referred to by his initials DB or co-conspirator one. So here's a little bit of background on this case. And it really starts in 2020 because that is when Banks was with his friend and fellow Chicago right, reputation, including the interview of one of witnesses, for example, right. assault at the direction of banks and to maintain their status in OTF. For example, based on evidence collected during the investigation, including the interview of one of witnesses, I know that banks put a monetary bounty out for an individual with whom banks was feuding named TB. And then there's a footnote at the bottom of that page that reads, due to serious safety concerns, this affidavit does not provide the identity of these witnesses. Based on the FBI's investigation, I know that witnesses and or their family members have already received threats and or have been contacted in what appears to be attempts to influence their participation in this investigation. What do you make of that, Bradford? So it, it's basic. You know, like a lot of these allegations, you can almost take each one of these and put them into every case that we've seen as of late, uh, where witnesses are either contacted or witnesses are offered a monetary amount not to testify. And sometimes that comes with uh, a civil case. You know, like if, if there's a civil matter that's outstanding, they might say, hey, listen, there's a civil matter that you could have and we're going to give you a settlement of X, Y, Z, the feds automatically take that as you're buying off a witness. So it, it just depends on the facts of those circumstances. Like I've seen it many times where the feds read into it uh, differently than you would if you just read it yourself, where in people are be trying to be influenced, a friend of a friend might contact you and say like, hey, listen, this isn't a good idea to be a witness in a federal case. The feds take that as, oh, hey, this is, you know, Bob Smith influencing this witness because he's friends with this person who's friends with that person. A lot of times that doesn't shake out the way that they put it in the indictment. And they put that in the indictment specifically for bond purposes. Right. So right, when you right. go in for bond, they say, hey, listen, this guy's trying to influence everybody. And here's all these things. But when you actually get into the case, sometimes those things don't shake out. And then it's already too late because you already moved for bond and you didn't get bond. That's the same thing that's happening with Sean Combs. I mean, well, that's Correct. a little different because he's not he's not charged specifically with obstruction, but it's part of the racketeering count. I read this indictment. I didn't see anything that a uh, little Dirk is charged specifically with obstruction or witness tampering. It's more the conspiracy. There's also uh, federal weapons charges. So does that give you pause too that he's not i mean again maybe i'm wrong that he wasn't directly charged with anything like witness tampering obstruction yeah it always gives me pause when, whenever the feds throw an indictment in it gives me pause right away <laughs> because a lot of times you'll see in the indictment there's a lot of accusations in the indictment that when you start getting into it and it starts kind of flushing out the facts they stretch what could be a basic fact they stretch it into something that it's not um, yeah, and I've seen this time and time again. So in this case, it could be individuals that are loosely associated with OTF or that is signed to the label or something else that has contacted a witness and they're trying to put whatever they did onto Dirk Banks. So okay. that's right. the issue right. here, right? Is that they're just glumping them all together. They'll just say, hey, listen, you know, because this guy did that, obviously Dirk is the quote unquote, leader of OTF, he must have known what was going on. Therefore, he shouldn't get a bond. 
because this is a dangerous gang and etc. You, you notice they stopped short of saying this is a dangerous gang and said this is a dangerous association of individuals that known as OTF, which I thought was interesting because generally speaking, when it comes to these any of these um, uh, rap groups, so like you know, there's OTF and uh, YNW and YSL, and they all say like, hey all of these nicknames, this is all a gang. And, uh, and you know, even though it's a record label, it's also a gang. And that's kind of their argument with every single one of these. And that's going to be their argument here. But I thought it was interesting in the indictment, it didn't specifically say gang. It said an association of individuals that go under OTF. I thought that was kind of interesting because I don't know what kind of evidence they have to say OTF is or is not a gang legally, the, the legal definition. I thought it was PTSD from the YSL trial. Let's huh. not uh, rush to call anything a, a gang because of all the yes. trouble there. That's yes. a separate conversation. Right. We can we can have a, a, yes, a, a long talk about that. Um, okay, but this I think could be problematic for uh, Little Dirk, and, and I'll get into this because on the morning of October 24th, we have federal and local law enforcement. They execute these search warrants in Chicago. They arrest Grant, Wilson, Jones, Lindsey, Houston. And that is when they learned that banks had booked multiple flights that were leaving the country. The affidavit says the FBI received notifications from U.S. Customs and Border Protection showing that banks had been booked as a passenger on two international flights. A one-way flight from Miami to Dubai, United Arab, Arab Emirates, connecting through Doha, Qatar, scheduled to depart the evening of October 24th. And one-way flight from Fort Lauderdale to Switzerland, connecting via New Jersey, also scheduled to depart the evening of October 24th. Now, banks didn't board either flight, but at approximately 6.40 p.m., the FBI received an additional CBP notification that banks had been booked as a passenger on a private plane departing Miami and destined for Italy, scheduled to depart at approximately 9 p.m. At approximately 8 p.m., banks was arrested by law enforcement in the vicinity of the departing airport. So, Bradford, I mean, that seems to be evidence that he might have been trying to leave the country. Uh, you tell me what you make of that. Oh. I make a couple different things of that. So the the first part of that is all the all the countries that he has that Dubai is going to extradite you. That's what I thought. All these countries are sending you to America. Switzerland's going to extradite you. They, these countries are going to extradite. You know, the only places that don't extradite are like you go to Vietnam, you go to Morocco. There's certain countries that don't extradite like strictly don't extradite all these other countries even if they don't even if they don't have a, a treaty with the u.s for extradition they're going to extradite because they rely on the u.s for money they rely on the u.s for support switzerland especially italy will deport you in about 10 seconds they'll extradite <laughs> you in 10 seconds so i don't make much of whether or not he was going to escape and, and flee the country I think more than likely, and sometimes this happens when. Uh, well, somebody said, "What about Bali?" I, I see y'all on Rumble. I see you, Beast. <laughs> it, it was unusual that there were so many booked. Right? What's not unusual is sometimes where an individual doesn't know whether or not there's a warrant out for their arrest, and I've seen this before it happened in the past, where some associates get arrested. And in order to see whether or not they have a warrant, because that's not public knowledge, whether or not they have a warrant, they'll book an international flight and it'll red flag them. And then they'll get a call from the FBI or their lawyer will get a call and they'll say, like, hey, your client's red flagged. They're, they're trying to get leave the country just so you know they're, they're under investigation or X, Y, Z. And you find out information you wouldn't necessarily find out. Now, I don't know if that's the case here because there were so many that were booked. Mm -hmm. But I have seen that before in the past where a client will call me and say, like, hey, Bob Smith got arrested. Can you check if I have a warrant? We can't check if there's a warrant. Oh, no one tells us there's a warrant. So just to be clear about that, just to be clear about that. So you're saying instead of they didn't have an option where he calls his lawyers and say, Hey, can you check with the feds to find out if there's a warrant out my, for my arrest? That wouldn't work. So you're saying this is a way for him to find out, hey, am I in trouble? I'm going to book these flights and see if they get flagged. Sure. And it's happened before. Now, the difference here is there's so many flights. You know, there's two or three flights that right. are booked. That's the weird part of it. But it wouldn't be weird for me to see someone that books a flight to the Bahamas. They book a flight to, you know, uh, uh, Italy or Spain. And then, you know, right. within six hours of booking that flight, they get a call or we get a call. That happens quite often. Now, it depends on your lawyer. Like, 
for example, me, if somebody it says to me, hey, do I have a warrant out? And you know, my associate got arrested. I've been doing this so long, I can make a phone call and not right. necessarily find out right. if there's a warrant, but I, I'll find out, they'll tell me, hey, listen, don't have your guy leave the country. Like he's, okay. he's yeah. being watched. And then, right. and then I know, okay, you know, just let me know if I need to surrender him or whatever I need to do. And that's the relationship that you build over 30 years. Not right. everyone can do that. That's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting alternative explanation for that. I'm sure it will come out in a, uh, a bond, <clears throat> excuse me, in a bond hearing if he's uh, questioned yeah. about that. So let me, let me go now to these alleged co-conspirators and what exactly right, happened this, here? Here's this, make sense. So the indictment that was filed in the central district of California gets into it and it says, that all of them conspired and agreed with each other to knowingly use facilities of interstate and foreign commerce, namely airplanes, cars, cell phones, and the internet with intent that the murder of TB be committed in violation of laws of any state, namely the state of California, as consideration for the receipt of and consideration for a promise and agreement to pay anything of pecuniary value, namely money and lucrative music opportunities with OTF. So this is a murder for hire plot in exchange for career opportunities or money. And according to the FBI and other investigators, Banks was the one who put out this call for a bounty. And then he got word that his apparent target, Bowman, was going to be visiting Los Angeles. So authorities say they have proof that Banks and our OTF provided the funds for five people to fly from Chicago to San Diego and then apparently drive to Los Angeles with the plan being to kill Mr. Bowman. The indictment lays out what we call overt acts that they say this group committed in furtherance of this conspiracy. You can't just have an agreement. You have to have overt acts, overt steps that were taken to actually commit this, uh, this, uh, uh, this crime. And the apparent proof ties it back to all the defendants. For example, one overt act says on August 18th, 2022, co-conspirator one texted co-conspirator three, don't book no flights under no names involved with me. So again, that's allegedly Lil Dirk writing that. There are text messages between three of the defendants showing that they had the same airline ticket information. One of them also messaged someone on Instagram to say, on my way to LA. And it's also being reported that Banks himself allegedly flew to Southern California on a private plane, was staying at a hotel in the San Fernando Valley. And authorities say they have camera footage that puts him there. Grant, who was allegedly a top OTF associate, bought ski masks, got cars, then gave three people guns, including one that had allegedly been converted into a machine gun. This is a federal crime. This is what prosecutors are alleging Grant did. And the indictment says that six people total, they traveled in two cars to the hotel in downtown LA where Bowman was supposedly staying. They allegedly started following Bowman, who was in a black Escalade with his cousin, Savia Robinson, known as SR. The indictment includes photos from a traffic camera showing the white infinity the suspects were in seemingly following the black SUV. And the indictment says that the suspects then followed the Escalade to a Beverly Hills gas station parked in an alley. And the indictment reads on August 19th, 2022 at the Beverly gas station, the defendants Jones and Lindsay and co-conspirator two used the firearms procured by defendant Grant, including the fully automatic firearm to shoot at TB's car, striking and killing SR, who was standing next to TB's car while TB was inside. And the images below show defendants Jones and Lindsay and co-conspirator two firing their guns at TB's black Escalade. So we have the death of SR, TB survived this attack. And the filing includes surveillance photos of what prosecutors say are the suspects appearing to fire guns towards the gas pumps. And you can see it's daylight in these photos at a gas station in the middle of Beverly Hills. So Bradford, whoever was responsible for this, what a blatant crime, what a blatant act in, in the middle of it. But talk to me how strong you think this case is based on what I've been saying. If we're trying to prove, if the prosecutors are trying to prove conspiracy, what do you make of some of this evidence? Text messages, surveillance, travel receipts, what do you make of it? I, I think that Dirk will have still have a defense. I think that, you know, I don't know everything that's going on. Obviously no one does. Uh, from what I'm reading in the indictment, I think there's some, there's some missing pieces there when it comes to Dirk about how involved he was in this alleged conspiracy. The other guys where they all have plane tickets, they all got a car, they, you know, uh, they're on tape. Th that's going to be a very difficult case for those lawyers who have that, um, who have that case. Because, you know, and I've said this multiple, multiple times on multiple cases, 
There are so many ways these days to catch individuals in this type of crime where you have cell phone records, GPS data, you're going to have um, cross-reference on the phones, what phones are together at what times. You're going to have car rental agreements. You're going to have videotapes. Um, you know, it's real funny because very often you find these, these red light cameras and things like that that the feds get on state cases where I want the footage, where I know it's good for my client. They're like, sorry, we don't save that footage. <laughs> but somehow the feds get you know, camera footage from red light cameras, camera footage from the next door neighbor, uh, camera footage from some guy who's just randomly on the street. So you'll see that they will put together a uh, a forensic case against the the actual shooters that, you know, will be very heavily based on cell phone records, GPS data and videotapes. Now, when it comes to um, Dirk Banks, you know, so far I've seen one text that says, don't have them associate my name with any kind of flights that they're taking. Certainly that's not a good text, but is that the only text? Because that doesn't, you know, that in itself doesn't stand on its own. Certainly it's circumstantial. Uh, but like I said, there's, we have to wait and see what other evidence they have. If they have a snitch, if they have videotapes or, or audio tapes of him saying something, I think that's a lot different uh, then, hey, just make sure you don't associate my name with these guys. Because it could be, he could be blaming, you know, Grant or one of these other guys and saying like, hey, these guys are going to do some crazy stuff. And he's like, yeah. hey, listen, make sure it doesn't associate with me at yeah. all. Because you can look at that a million different ways. So I'm, I'm hesitant to say that they have, you know, a slam dunk case on, on Dirk Banks. I, I think that they have a long way to go on Dirk Banks in order to prove the conspiracy against him. I think the others, I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be very heavily based on paperwork. So in other words, I mean, look, I said it before, what a blatant attack. You're shooting in yeah. the middle of the day near gas pumps, which could explode. If you make the argument that the case against the shooters is really strong, could there be a, a situation where they work out an attractive plea deal? I don't know what an attractive plea deal would look like for them, considering what they're facing and what the accusations are, where they turn on Lil Dirk. I mean, what would be a scenario that would look that, what kind of deal could be worked out where if, where you're working a deal out with the alleged shooters to go after the principal of this case or the alleged so principal? It's happened quite often in the past. And if you told me, you know, the deal that Sammy the Bull worked out, right? The guy killed like 19 or 20 people. He ended up getting, I don't know, a year or two in jail followed by probation. If you told me that was a deal, that someone would get for you know being associated with 19 or 20 murders, I would tell you that's an, an impossible right. deal to get. So it all depends on the hunger of the U.S. attorney and the AUSA that's involved. And if they want this individual badly Man. enough, they'll make very attractive deals for these individuals. What, if, what does a very attractive deal look like? I think they go for the lowest hanging fruit, uh, whoever you know, didn't actually kill the guy, you know, maybe someone that was involved that didn't didn't actually shoot or someone that shot, but it didn't hit, you know, they, they're going to have forensics. Yeah. So they'll take whoever is the least culpable. And I think that they'll approach him and make a deal with him, um, with, that'll be the most attractive. And if that guy doesn't make a deal, they'll move on to the next guy. So usually that's what happens, right? You go for the lowest hanging fruit first, right. the guy that you think will flip, the guy that didn't really have that much involvement. And I think what also is interesting with the indictment is it wasn't just money. They're like, oh, it could have been money or it could have been career advancement. Right. Which is, it's strange to mention that because they don't really go into any kind of facts about it. They just say it could have been, you know, that they would have advanced in their career. But what does that look like? Dirk promised them like a record deal? Like doesn't Or, or they assumed it. Strange. And if they assumed it, that's a weaker case for the prosecution. If it was just like, oh, I assumed if I did this for him, you know, um, that's, so you got it. That's the key, right? They're like, right. hey, I knew if I helped him out, he would he would give me a record deal. Now, let me put a bow on this. By the way, I, 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 I want to point this out continually. And, you know, I, I think it was somebody from THF who said this. And I just think this is very obvious. These guys who are charged are not contract killers. OK. They're not people who don't have any emotion, 
who don't have any ties to the situation, the get back for um, King Vaughn, everybody who was in OTF, everybody who was a street nigga who was uh, allegedly associated with Dirk had an incentive to do. They have an incentive because people are saying the entire group got a slide for Vaughn, not just only Dirk. So it's it's kind of also plausible that Dirk doesn't have to offer y'all money. Now, if he facilitates, I mean, that's still part of offering money, I guess, but not really. But th that's part of him being a conspiracy, not necessarily murder for hire. Usually with murder for hire, it assumes that the people doing the killing have no interest in killing the person. They're being hired as murderers. They're being hired as killers, but they don't necessarily care either or that the person gets killed. In this situation, it's not the truth, right? Everybody wants to slide for Vaughn, right? It's not just Dirk saying, hey, here is this money, and that's going to come down to it. Because, you know, if they throw this, these innocuous things like, oh, career advancement, maybe he thought OTF Didi was a great rapper. OTF Didi sat with me on Off the Record. They were trying to promote the guy, clearly. Who knows if he was just like, oh, no, this is just payback for me trying to get your career off the ground because you killed this guy for me. We don't know. Like, that's something that could be argued. As opposed to somebody saying, in a Dolph situation, you heard what that guy, the, the Cornelius guy said. He said, yo, I don't know. Uh, I'm Dolph from a can of paint. All I know, it was $50,000. I need $50,000. That's classic murder for hire. Classic, right? Classic murder for hire. You, how much money you getting? What was promised? What did you get? Now, sometimes what you get is not what you're promised. Obviously, because if the cops come in and they fuck it up in the Dolph case. But here, we don't know how much was promised. How much was promised? How much money was on Kwando's head? We don't know. And maybe we find out at a point, but right now we don't know. And talk about what happened after the shooting. The suspects that apparently went to an In-N-Out hamburger stand to talk about payment for the murder then they flew home to chicago from san diego wilson later p paid jones and lindsey an undisclosed amount of money that's how prosecutors say this uh, murder plot ended but the indictment it charges the five named defendants and the five alleged co-conspirators with violation of the u.s code it's 1958 use of interstate commerce facilities in the commission of murder for hire it's part of the statute dealing with racketeering and because someone was killed Banks faces life in prison or possibly the death penalty if he's convicted. And all the defendants, they're also charged with firearm possession resulting in a death. The indictment says they knowingly used and carried firearms, including a firearm that defendants Grant, Wilson, Jones, Lindsay, and Houston knew to be a machine gun during and or in relationship to and possess such firearms in furtherance of a crime of violence. In so doing, discharge the firearms resulting in the death of SR. And defendant Keith Jones, he's also charged separately for knowingly possessing a machine gun, namely a 10 millimeter caliber firearm equipped with an auto sear conversion device, which was designed and intended solely and exclusively for use in converting a weapon into a machine gun, which defendant Jones knew to be a machine gun. Yeah, wild. So my Quando Rondo were, were 10K. A life is priceless, people. Yo, let me tell you this. If I was somebody who's a street nigga, well, well, well uh, I guess it won't matter with me saying it, right? Because, because you have to think about somebody who's not broke. But if you are somebody who is a killer, the price of you killing someone should not be the price of what you need or what their life is worth. The price should be what you taking that risk should be, right? How much, like... Well, if, if I said to you this, I don't like someone and I want you to kill them, but I want you to give me a price for you to kill them, not based on what you think they're worth, because you don't know that person. You don't care. Right. I want you to give me a price based on you taking a risk of getting caught, never going to tell on me. And also knowing that when you get caught, you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail. If you get caught, what's the price on that risk? If you tell me the price on that risk is $50,000, first of all, I wouldn't even go for that because it tells me <coughs> you got to be suicidal. <coughs> Sorry. If, if, if the price on your freedom is $50,000, I'm good. 
But that's how it should be looked at. I think when people think, oh, they got money on somebody's head. And you're like, oh, well, well, Dolph is 100000 The people who were doing the murder should have said, what price would I consider taking this risk, which has probably a 90% I'm going to get caught ratio. 90%. And if I get caught, I'm doing life. There's a 10% chance I don't get caught. But I also have to move different. I have to do a lot of things and be in a way where I wouldn't get caught. That's going to cost a lot of money. Combine those two things. What's the price for that? Now, that's usually for people who are smart. And obviously, the, the, one of the unfortunate things about most of these crimes we're seeing these guys aren't smart, so, you know, it is what it is. Machine gun. So, Bradford, I've laid out the, the what we know so far. Uh, we expect at this point Banks to be extradited from Florida, where he was arrested, to California to face these charges. Talk to me about the next steps, particularly uh, the issue of bail and, and how you think that might work with defendant uh, Lil Dirk and how that's going to work with the other co-defendants. Let's start there. Okay, so with Dirk, what happens is when you get arrested in the feds, the feds have three days to get together a bond pass if they request it. So you, you get arrested, you show up in front of a judge, you say, judge, uh, we're not agreeing to, you know, pretrial detention, which is what the government always seeks on these type of cases, especially with this type of case. Uh, I don't think that they're going to seek the death penalty on this case. It's not one of those cases that would be appropriate for it. I'd be shocked. I mean, shocked. Um, but long story short is when you're arrested in a, yeah, let's look the last time, last time feds tried to get death penalty in case. Um, let's look last. Oh, okay. Okay. We already, we already see something here. Look at this. The federal government, this is 2019, um, to resume capital punishment after two de decade lapse. So they didn't go after it for two decades, right? Like, they're not going to go after it for motherfucking little Dirk. Um, up to the attorney general's discretion is going to be these ones, okay? And I guess these. Let me see. Capital punishment. When's the last time they've went after somebody for... No, those are assassins. List of people executed by the... Okay, when's the last time? All right, the last time appears to be... 2001? Yeah, you, you gotta be a terrorist. Look, this guy bombed like a federal building or some shit like that. Like, yeah, you're dying, nigga. Eight, eight federal law enforcement um, got killed, you're dying. Okay? If they caught them niggas, them little hoodlums... Um, them Alu Wapbar niggas from motherfucking uh, um, 9 11, they be over here too. Real talk. But I'm not. Nah, nah, nah. they, they ain't gonna kill no little dirt. They don't give a fuck about that. He's just gonna spend life in jail. In another jurisdiction, you can move for bond in that jurisdiction. They can, he can move for bond here and then have the judge in California review that bond if it's denied or even if it's granted. And I've had issues where. I filed in Florida. They're arrested in Florida, but it's a case out of uh, – most recently, I had a case out of uh, Massachusetts. The judge in Florida granted me a bond, and the U.S. attorney in Massachusetts said, I want the judge up here to review it to revoke the bond, uh, and that was denied. But, I, I mean, he, we went for a bond hearing, but the judge in Massachusetts still upheld the bond. So generally down here what will happen is, okay, he goes in front of the judge. The judge says, hey, you want a bond hearing? I usually say, yeah, I want a bond hearing here as opposed to California because of a couple of different reasons. One is if it's a judge that I know and I know how they uh, behave in court, I can get a lot of information about the case. They put a case agent on. They might put another witness on and I can find out a lot of more a lot more details about the case so that when they do go to California, I'm kind of prepared with, OK, I know where they're going with the case. I know what else they have. It's not just. Uh, this one text, it's something else. I kind of see their their case and it, it prepares me to go to California and then have that case reviewed by the California judge. And now I'm even more prepared for that next bond hearing. 
uh, in front of the California judge. But I don't know what they're going to do in this case. They could just say, hey, judge, extradite him to California. The California lawyers are going to deal with the bond in California and move for bond there. And like I said, once he gets there. I see some people say Trump would partner him. Pardon him. Um, let me look up. When's the last time? Uh, 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 when has a president ever pardoned a murderer? Oh, okay. Well, they commuted and rescinded the convictions of the. Uh, nah. Okay, it's been done before, but it was like, look, it's a military court. Most presidents don't pardon murderers. Trump did it in May again. Did Trump do it? Oh, it's also he pardoned a war criminal. Okay, allegedly war criminal. It was America? Okay, okay, okay. All right, and it, it wasn't even like a full pardon. It was like he commuted his sentence, I guess. Right? Yeah, yeah. They're not like again. You know, obviously, what, what people don't know. So. The sitting president, which a lot of people don't, I don't know if y'all don't know or y'all just are ignorant of or you just act like you don't know. They could only pardon federal crimes, not state crimes. Now, obviously, they could have a whole lot of influence if they wanted someone who was charged on a state crime to be pardoned. And I'm not actually sure if the, the case would need to be completed or, you know, you know, like it could be a formality where you just take a plea just to get pardoned if it needs to be completed. But, um... Yeah, it, the president of the United States deals with federal crimes, right? Um, your state governor could pardon state crimes. And, and, and again, most cases are state crimes. So, like, you know, we all, I, I keep telling y'all, we care so much about the president of the United States. Like, you know, if you clapped a nigga in North Dakota, or not clap because they're not going to pardon a murderer, bro, but, like, let's say it was some crime. You want the governor of that state, like for example, even like Meek Mill and like all this shit with like Philly, like Meek is no longer a felon, but that's primarily because of not only the work the reform the reform group did, but also the governor. The governor was rocking with them, and the governor appreciates how much Meek has done with the reform stuff, and they have made it that Meek is not a a felon anymore. Meek could own a gun, you know what I mean? So again, you know, state charges. Governor, federal charges, president. Okay. However, president could affect the the the, the state, um, uh, um, the state charges just based on because he just has so much power and, and the state relies on the feds, um, as opposed to the feds relying on the state. Um, does a governor could a governor influence a president? Uh, I would probably think not, unless it's like a, a like a Texas that. Those those states like, you know, especially for Republicans, they need or maybe California for like liberal or um, uh, Democratic um, president. Right. But not going to happen. Anyway, they'll have a couple days to prepare. The, uh, the the government will have a couple days to prepare. And now because it'll take a week to get there, they'll have even more time to prepare. That's why I like to do them quick. I like to do bond hearings quick because it doesn't give them that much time to prepare. And especially when you're in a different jurisdiction, the agent usually has to fly here, prep the U.S. attorney right. that's here. All those things come into strategy play. My guess is on this type of case, the judge is probably not going to give him a bond. That's my mm -hmm. guess. Uh, I kind of know the facts. I know the attorneys that are involved. Uh, I, I don't see where the judge will be, especially the Florida judge would be like, yeah, this sounds like a case. I'm going to give him bond and send him to California. If anything, he's got a better shot in California of getting a bond than Florida. Now, okay, bet. Uh, that's pretty much it. Now, 